It's exciting to welcome you to our second season of the January series in July. My name is Michael Wiltske, the director of the series. As we left our series in January, I challenged us to continue being curious. The gift of curiosity is that it can always be there, and summer sometimes allows us to be even more curious. Travel or a change of routine allows us to experience new perspectives and ideas. The January series is grateful to our underwriters and supporters for enabling us to share three more opportunities to be curious. Today, we are joined by Professor Kevin Timpey, the Jellema Chair in Christian Philosophy here at Calvin University. Today's conversation will focus on the philosophy of disability and larger questions that Kevin's been studying. We are joined by a special guest interviewer today, Professor Nick Wolterstorff, Emeritus Professor of Philosophy both here at Calvin and at Yale University. Kevin's research challenges us to all think more about inclusion, disability, and how the church can be a better place when we invite disabled voices into the conversation. Enjoy week two of the January series in July. Good morning, Kevin. Good morning, Nick. I look forward to this very much. Me too. An opening disclaimer, um, I have thought regrettably, I guess, very little about disability. You have thought and written a great deal about it. So this is not going to be a conversation among two people equally informed, but it's going to be, by and large, my prompting you to uh, present to our viewers some of what you've thought and written about disability. Um, and um, let me just say to, uh, to the viewers that I view what Kevin has written in a few books, essays, and so forth as a really important contribution to thinking about disability. Um, so Kevin, you've devoted a great deal of your time, as I've suggested, to, of, of your time as a philosopher, to thinking and writing about disability. What, what prompted you to do that? It's, um, um, it's a more common topic, but reading your references makes clear to me that it's a more common topic among philosophers than I had thought it was. But still, I know the literature of contemporary philosophy fairly well, and the, and the discussion about disability is, to the best of my knowledge, a minor part of it. So, so what, what led you to spend a good deal of your career on this minor topic? So for me, like for many folks that, that work on the topic, it came out of our lived experience and our family's lived experience. And up until about 15 years ago, I was in the position that uh, I think a lot of folks are, not having thought carefully about disability, either just as a person or as a philosopher. Um, uh, my wife and I have three children, and the oldest, uh, a few months after he was born, was diagnosed with an extremely rare genetic condition. There's only about 70 known cases in the world. How many? At all, about 70. Seven zero? Yep. Wow. Um, and so part of that has meant a great learning experience for us. Um, that genetic condition highly correlates with an autism diagnosis and an ADHD diagnosis. And so from the time he was about six months old, we've been figuring out what this means for us as parents. Um, when he was in first grade, we discovered that uh, his public school had been educating him in violation of both state and federal law. So we had to educate ourselves enough to sort of push back on what he deserved. And at the same time, I was coming up to my first sabbatical, and I had uh, written a lot of uh, my earlier scholarship, as I think you know, on issues related to free will, yep. moral responsibility, and agency. And I thought, since I'm now devoting so much of this other part of my life to thinking about disability, maybe I'll turn some of my scholarly work towards thinking about disability in general and disability's impact on agency. And so for me, the, the, the turn was just our family was thrown into a situation that we didn't understand. I wish I had thought more about this before, but it uh, just became clear to, to us that we would have to be dealing with this for a while. We'd have to be thinking about it. And it's been extremely rewarding uh, as a philosophical topic um, to me. There's just so much interesting work in metaphysics, epistemology, ethics that relates to, to things like disability, much like there is that relates to issues of sex and gender that have been wonderful for me to think about and be able to teach about. 
So that's interesting. So it, it hasn't been this narrow topic, but it's opened up, opens itself up to lots of other topics. Yeah, so actually over the last three to five years, I've written uh, a lot more broadly than it, any other time in my career, hmm. and the common theme is disability. Mm -hmm. So I've got a paper with Joel Michael Reynolds about um, social epistemology. I've got a couple of papers uh, in, I've got I think three papers now in social philosophy about structural uh, injustices as they relate to disability and education uh, and public policy. I've got work on sort of the, the metaphysics and ontology. Of, of disability, and then there's all sorts of really important ethical issues about how we treat folks in our communities. So I've got work connecting ethics to Wow, that's fine. you've got 50 years of writing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Kevin, there are, um, uh, this, this continues that topic, actually. There are a number of things, a couple of things that I very much admire in your writing, and one is this. Let me give a, a stereotype of two kinds of philosophers. Um, one kind of philosopher, let's just call him the, the classic German philosopher, 25 years old, has a vision for a system, 13 volume system, let's say, allows nothing to distract him, absolutely nothing to distract him. He hopes to finish the 13th volume shortly before his death uh, so that he won't be left with, you know, without something to do and so forth. That's one kind of philosopher, the inner directed philosopher, not allowing things that happen to distract them from their philosophical goal. The other kind of philosopher is the philosopher that allows what is it where God drops on his or her doorstep to become a topic of reflection. And you've been very much that second kind of philosopher. God has dropped this at, on your doorstep and you, instead of walking over it or walking around it, you, you, you've taken it up and that's, that's admirable. What, what kind of psychological question is it? What, what, do you understand yourself well enough to say why it was that you didn't just, like most philosophers, step over or around it? Uh, well, in part, the answer is that for, for me, philosophy has always been sort of where I found I myself. I see, okay. okay. Um, in my, it was in college when I first took a philosophy class that I was also thinking about issues about freedom and responsibility and religious belief and the nature of faith. And so for me, philosophy in some way has always been an attempt to understand the issues that okay. sort of dominate okay. my, my inner psychological and philosophical life. Um, but I do think uh, that there's a way in which sort of that tendency is heightened with, with my work of, mm -hmm. on, on disability. And part of that is just over the past uh, 10 years or so, I've been thinking uh, more and more and shaped more and more by feminist philosophy and the emphasis there on taking seriously not just sort of idealized systems of thought, but the kind of world that we find yeah. ourselves in. Um, and so uh, I've, been, I've been doing that more and more because I found myself in a situation that I don't understand, that the people around me don't understand, that uh, puts certain kinds of barriers and difficulties. And philosophy has actually been really helpful uh, to me in just trying to figure out the lay of all of that land. Yeah. One of my favorite um, philosophy articles by Eva Cate is entitled, the, the personal is philosophical is political. Uh, <laughs> and, and she draws very nicely the way in which our personal experiences, right, what God drops on our doorsteps, uh, uh, is connected with what we think about philosophically and what we think about as, as a community, right? Political here isn't just sort of the partisan American binary between Democrats and, and Republicans. It's the way, it's sort of the Aristotelian view of the political, how we live together in community. Yeah. And yeah. what we've experienced, what I, uh, you know, have been thinking about, and the way that I see the nature of community, both in general and Christian community, are all deeply interwoven uh, in, in this way now. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, uh, open, Candor uh, uh, requires that I confess that I've been the same kind of philosopher. Um, I was the abstract philosopher for a decade or so until I was sent by Calvin to a conference in South Africa. And there I heard so-called coloreds in South Africa speak up and call for justice. And that, I felt that that was a call from, from God. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's when I began writing in an advocacy way about justice. Um, 
So there's another thing about your career that I would like to highlight, and that is that you and I have both identified ourselves as Christian philosophers. A good many of the viewers will be aware, I think, that over the past 50 years there's been a, a remarkable renaissance of Christian philosophical thought, at least in the Anglo-American world, less in the continental world. But, that, but there's been a certain narrowness about that renaissance. It is focused on beliefs, on religious beliefs, on is it responsible to hold religious beliefs? What, what, what is, how do we understand the content of religious beliefs? God's omnipotence and God's all goodness and so forth. And, and of course, religion includes beliefs, but it includes so much more, uh, practices of all sorts. And so it's been, there's some, been something strange about the movement. And you and I have both bucked against that. Um, you by focusing on how do we think about and deal with disability, I by talking about justice, about liturgy, and so forth. So, so I admire your breaking open the field, as it were. <laughs> Thank you. And, and again, that's something that uh, I think you're right that the Christian philosophy has, for much of its recent history, been focused primarily on metaphysics and epistemology and certain issues in ethics. Right? Yeah. But there are other folks that have, like yourself, your work on, on liturgy, for instance, uh, there's great work uh, being done in political philosophy. Christian philosophers have sometimes just had a narrower range of the important topics. Yeah. And, and a lot of these other topics are just interesting in their own right. Yeah. How we think about the nature of gender, how we think about uh, the, the moral value of animals, for instance. Yeah. Um, but there are also things that I think connect very closely with the Christian faith. Um, a few years ago when your, when your uh, memoir came out, In This World of Wonder, yep. I, I loved hearing the story have all, how all these topics sort of fell on you, <laughs> yeah, and you right. never sort of sought to develop right, a particular part of your research agenda. They were kind of given to you. Yeah. Um, but also, one of my, I think my favorite passage in that book is when you're talking about education, you talk about how education isn't primarily content mastery, it's vista opening. Yeah. And I love that phrase. And I think that sort of this broadening of Christian philosophical attention to the, right, the nature of families, uh, our responsibility as parents, our responsibility to future generations, right? Like all of this range of issues to, to practices is a kind of vista opening for Christian yeah. philosophy that I think is a, is a really good term. I still happen to really like metaphysics and epistemology I do, and, I do and, too. and ethics. Um, so it's not to say that those aren't right, appropriate right. topics, but there are more topics than a lot of the community has given yeah. time to, and yeah. I think this is a good development. Yeah, great, great. Okay, so let's, um, those are sort of introductory matters. Let's begin to get to the substance. Kevin, the more I read around in your writing and in some of the things that you pointed me to, the less I understood what it was we were talking about. What is a disability? I felt my grip on the concept beginning to slither away from me. And then on page 102 of this fine little booklet, Disability and Inclusive Communities, I find you saying, what counts as a disability is a more complicated question than we often think. The exact lines of disability are blurry. <laughs> exactly. So let's talk about that a little bit. So. Tell me if I'm just on the wrong track. A disability is a, a lack of an ability to do something, obviously, but it's not a lack of an ability to do any old thing. I can't jump seven feet high, but that's not a disability. So thinking about it, it occurred to me that there must be, or maybe there is in the background, the notion of a normal person, and a disability is an inability to do something that a normal person of my age and gender would be able to do. Um, but I fear that this, if, I, if that's right, that this concept of a normal person as it functions here is pretty slithery. Mm. Um, am I on the wrong track here? No, I think that that's right. I mean, for a lot of history, disability has been seen as somebody can't, who can't do something that they're supposed to do. Yeah. Um, but that a normal person th would. But that's yeah. opposed to there is tricky, right? Yeah. Is it just statistical normal? Yeah. Or is it, right, sort of like an Aristotelian, there, that there is this human nature and folks yep. that don't live up to that human nature in certain ways. 
Um, but this is, you know, this is a problematic way of approaching uh, disability in a lot of our history. This is what leads Aristotle, for instance, to say that women are deformed men, uh, right? They, they, are, uh, they are men who haven't been baked properly in the developmental process, right? And it leads to a kind of devaluing. So, so I think it is really hard to get clear on what exactly a disability is. When I first started writing on it, uh, I was working on a manuscript, and I started a footnote. As, a, as an analytically trained philosopher, if I'm going to talk about something, I want to give an account of what that thing is, the necessary and sufficient conditions. <laughs> and that footnote became a 15,000 word paper that was recently published, um, in, in which I argue that there's not a single concept of disability. It's rather a cluster concept. Okay. And which okay. of these concepts we pick out, for instance, is a function of history, our background presuppositions, and what we want to do with that. So for instance, uh, it is probably pretty widely regarded that dyslexia is a good example of a disability. Um, hmm. But in the medieval period, right, when most people aren't literate, the standard forms of dyslexia wouldn't have come up as, right, like interfering with people's lives in any kind of, of substantive ways. Um, so I've been shaped uh, by, again, work in feminist uh, thought uh, on sort of what we're trying to do with our concepts and, and thinking about our accounts of the nature of things uh, in a certain way. So H Sally Haslinger has this really nice paper um, where she delineates a number of different things that we try to do with the question, what is some concept X, right? So one way of doing this is what she calls the conceptual project, right? Trying to get clear on what our concept of yeah. this thing is. This is standard yeah. analytic yeah. conceptual engineering, conceptual analysis. She also talks then about the descriptive process, uh, project. Once we have a concept, then we try to sort of demarcate what falls under that concept versus what doesn't, right? Where, where do the boundaries of that concept yep, yep. carve the world in yep. certain ways? But she also talks about the ameliorative process. So she, she uh, the ameliorative project. She says that uh, what are the purposes that we hope to accomplish with our concept? And so she thinks of concepts as tools for various kinds of purposes. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a, a really yeah. helpful way of thinking about it, but it shows just how slippery, how bifurcated, yeah. right? how, how sort of blurry uh, the concept is. So to illustrate this with the concept of disability, um, one of the two major laws in, in, in uh, the US that talks about disability is the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, passed in 1990. And it defines a disability as uh, somebody is disabled if they satisfy one of three criteria. The first is probably how most of us think about disability. Uh, a person uh, has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. Right, so if somebody um, is um, a paraplegic and they're unable to walk, then there are certain kinds of life activities that we might think that they're yep. unable to happen. Uh, the second uh, criteria is that the person has a record of such an impairment. Right, so the idea here is if somebody uh, is, uh, has a cancer diagnosis, right, when you're going through cancer treatment and the way that cancer affects all aspects of your life, cancer counts as a disability according to the ADA. I see. But if somebody is uh, uh, in remission, yep. they still have to pay attention to all that. So you have a history of, mm -hmm. uh, of an impairment. Or the third criteria is that you're perceived as having an impairment by others. Ooh. And, and this is super interesting. What the ADA is trying to do is enact civil rights legislation that prohibits discrimination. Yeah. And so if what you're doing is trying to prevent discrimination against people, you have to pay attention to the, the work that other people's conceptions of a person is doing, right? So if you're trying to protect people from getting fired because they're not the right sorts of person, if a person has facial scarring, for instance, or a facial burn, right, even if it doesn't impair their ability to talk or their ability to eat, or, you wouldn't want somebody to be fired simply because yep. 
they look a certain way. And so in order to accomplish what the law was trying to do, it had to have a, an understanding of what disability yep. is that yep. would function um, uh, to do that, right? And so uh, you also see this uh, with respect to certain, um, certain specific disabilities. There's uh, at least two uh, widely accepted uh, criteria for whether or not somebody is autistic. There's a, a definition of autism in the DSM-5, the Diagnostics and Statistics Manual that psychologists and psychiatrists use. There's also a, a, an account of what having autism is in the, uh, federal, the other most important federal law about disabilities, uh, the Individ uh, um, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act that governs uh, public education. And the two definitions of what it means to be autistic actually differ, and it's possible to satisfy one criteria without mm. the other, because the two laws that are giving those definitions are trying to do different things. two different things. So in a recent book that I just started reading, uh, Just Care, Akima Nishida defines disability in a really interesting way. She says that disability is, quote, a catch-all for, for whoever does not neatly fit into the notion of normal. <laughs> While go. such a normal well, while such a notion is also socially, politically constructed, right? And so sometimes disability in history has functioned as just a way of, of saying, you're not the right sort of person. You don't belong. We don't think that you fit into our community. And this is what we've seen play out in various kinds of ways, right? In the uh, 19th century, for instance, one of the arguments given for why blacks shouldn't be granted their freedom to justify slavery was that blacks were biologically unable to handle freedom. And so that if we freed the slaves, this, this was argued by the uh, president of the American Medical Association in the Journal of the American Medical Association. If we free the slaves, they're going to become disabled. And you also had a similar kind of move in the uh, uh, early 20th century debates about women's suffrage. Right, and this goes back to the idea uh, earlier of Aristotle yeah. of, about that women are just biologically unable to handle because uh, uh, a certain kinds of political rights because they're inherently emotional and and not rational in the same way that males are rational. And so if we gave them the right to vote, they're not going to be able to exercise it. Well, they're disabled with respect to their emotional regulation. And so disability historically has functioned as a way of just othering people for the no. sake of mm. preventing either kinds of protections or valuation or inclusion in communities. And so we have to take seriously the history of how that concept has played out. So that's all very helpful. Um, I want to continue just briefly by ask, asking about some examples. But so I think I've got a pretty good grip on physical disabilities, uh, deafness, blindness, um, a serious limp. Though let me add, I have a nephew, Stephen, who became completely deaf shortly after birth. He does not want to hear. Now I've never asked him, Stephen, do you regard deafness as a disability? But I think he'd probably say, mm -hmm. it's, no, no, why do you want to call it a disability? Um, so that's been for me a very striking thing. But, but I've got, uh, what is the literature, what do you say about, well, let me just call them mental phenomena, attention deficit disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, Down syndrome, um, um, dementia. Are those in the disorder literature, disability literature, are those classified as disabilities? Mm -hmm. Actually, if I, yeah. if I can comment on the, on the uh deafness issue first, and then I'll yeah, get to the yeah. second part of your answer. Deafness is actually a really interesting example, right? So there, there are two ways that the word deaf gets used. One is just in terms of your ability to hear, uh, right, certain uh, ranges of sound, yeah. certain volumes of sound, right? And this is often uh, deaf with a lowercase d. There's also deaf with a capital D, which is seen as uh, a, a cultural phenomenon. Right, so you have like deaf communities, um, and so lots of people that are deaf think of their deafness not just as the lack of the ability to hear within certain ranges, but as an identity, as a cultural identity. And so there are many 
deaf with a capital D people that deny that their deafness is a disability. They just think it's a different way of being human and a different cultural mm -hmm. phenomenon, which gets tricky because if it's not a disability, then they're not protected by oh, the, oh. Right? So, so there's this like this this tension between whether or not they think that there is something inherently bad about de being deaf or if they need to identify as disabled for the sake of getting certain kinds of protections right so it, deafness is actually a really interesting case yeah so, so in the so, literature so Stephen says hey look i can talk with my hands and i can listen with my hands why, why do i have to have mm -hmm. Why do you think I have to have sounds? <laughs> and it's especially interesting because uh, various kinds of sign language, like American Sign Language or ASL, uh, can communicate in ways that spoken English can't, right? So there's actually uh, this phenomena that a lot of uh, deaf people talk about called deaf gain. There's actually some benefit, right? Deafness isn't just a loss, deaf culture and, and deaf uh, language is actually an enriching phenomenon. Here, here's a little anecdote. I was sitting in a restaurant once with two deaf people, then one of them left. They're, we're sitting next to the window, a large window. He stands outside, one of them, and he communicates with the remaining deaf person. I can't communicate, but these two people can communicate right. at a distance through this window. <laughs> one of our daughters is actually taking ASL as her second language in middle school. And so she comes home and teaches us some yeah. of it, which, which I love the fact that she has this opportunity. Um, so as we picked up some of it, there's a way in which if we're at a lacrosse match or right at church and she's across the lobby or something like that, I can communicate with her <laughs> at a distance without lots of, right? So there is a, a very real right. benefit even to the, to the little right. bit of ASL right. that I have. But I, but I interrupted you. Um. No, I, I think that's all we're thinking about in terms of, of deafness. You asked about these other kinds of conditions yeah, sure. like um, attention deficit disorder or post-traumatic stress. Um, Down syndrome. Yep. So in, in my work, in part because I don't think that we have one concept of a disability. Okay. Right? We have lots of concepts. Okay. It's important for us to, to begin with not sort of the, the genus, right? Okay. Sort of what all disabilities have in common, but to begin uh, our reflection with individual conditions. And for, right, so we need to have what we say about disability in general greatly shaped by what we think about um, dwarfism or deafness yep. or Down syndrome, right? And so a lot of these conditions that you mention, I think that at least many of the instances of them can in fact be dis disability. Okay. In the same way that deafness, right, is a very degreed concept. Um, attention dis deficit is degreed, right? The, yeah. the impact yeah. of PTSD yeah. is degreed. Yeah. Uh, the, the range of impact uh, of, of even something like Down syndrome, right, which is a third copy of the 21st chromosome, is incredibly wide. Uh, and so I don't want to say that all instances of this whole range of condition, right, are disabilities in all senses of that term. But it certainly can be, right? Um, uh, I, I've had issues of depression in my life. I don't think of myself as disabled because of my history with depression, but I certainly think that some kinds of depression can in fact oh, yeah. be disabling. Um, I've got a very minor form of dyslexia um, that has never impaired my ability to, to read or to write. Um, I don't think that my dyslexia is a disability just because if, uh, it hasn't impaired any of my yep, major life yep. function. But there are certainly forms of dyslexia that I think in certain contexts can be disabilities. I think that often we're more comfortable thinking about physical disabilities because those are the ones that, that are more obvious yep, to us, yep. right? I mean, you can often tell uh, whether or not if somebody is an amputee, if, if somebody, right? You, there's a, yeah. a, a visual yeah. representation yep. that most people with Down syndrome have. Um, uh, somebody who is blind, you recognize as blind often, right? Just sort of the way that they move through public can use a white cane, et cetera, yep. et cetera. Um, but a lot of these other disabilities for, especially if we don't know the person well or what get called invisible, invisible disabilities, we might not recognize. And so both because we're more comfortable with physical disabilities, but also because even how we think about disabilities kind of sometimes has a hierarchy, right? I think that we're, less familiar with and, and more cautious about some of these other conditions. Um, so I think that we uh, 
culturally, right? Not you and I, uh, but but the culture that we have grown up in, that we've been steeped in, that we've inherited, thinks about intellectual disability as inher as an inherently bad thing. Uh, right? And we think of, yep. of intellectually disabled people as less than in all sorts of ways. And if we ask people to make that explicit, it makes them uncomfortable, right? Yep. So this is, I think, one of the reasons why we tend to, to, to dominate uh, a lot of our cultural thinking about disabilities in terms of physical disabilities rather than intellectual or developmental or emotional disabilities. But all these other kinds of conditions, I think, are such that they really are disabilities in most of yeah, the, the yeah. major senses of those terms. So we should think of a disability as a sort of family concept of, yep. of the, rather than a rigid, well-defined concept. Yeah, yeah. so in the yeah. paper that I mentioned earlier where I argue against a unified concept of disabilities, this is, I, I argue that it's a cluster concept. And in some yeah. ways it's, it's similar to like our concept of a game, right? We all yeah. have a concept of a game that's good enough for us to sort of right, come up with the paradigm cases, right? right. Poker is a game, right? Curling is a game. But when we start asking people, like, what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for games, or whether, right, certain kinds of things, is playing patty cake with a two-year-old a game? <laughs> well, sort of. Sort of. Right? And for a two-year-old, it probably is. Yes. Yeah. Um, Kevin, um, what I found a really illuminating part of your work was your calling attention to what you call the social dimension of disability. That, I feel stupid to say that it never occurred to me that it, but it, but it clearly does have a social dimension. The inability to do something, some certain thing, often has something to do with the social, and, well, social and physical environment mm -hmm. in which you find yourself. So, help us, help us think a little bit about the social dimension. Some people, in fact, adopt what they call the social model. I'd read you as not going that far, but social yeah. dimension. So there's two primary yeah. ways that people think about disabilities. They get called the medical model and the social model. And there are other models too, but okay. just for today, we'll just yeah. Yeah. talk about two. The medical model thinks about disability as sort of a biological uh, feature just of a person's body. Yeah. And if disability is all in that person's body, then the way to sort of deal with it is try to cure it or to fix it, yep. right? To um, Give some crutches or... Um, yeah, something like that. Um, so if a person is breaks their leg and they're unable to, to walk to their office, then we give them a temporary office elsewhere or we get, you know, help them learn to navigate stairs on crutches or, yep. or something like that. The social model of disability says, no, in fact, disability is primarily a dis disconnect between people and their environments. Um, and so uh, what is disabling about not being able to walk isn't necessarily that your legs don't move in certain ways, but that you have to live and navigate and exist in an environment that is only built for people that can do the certain kinds of things, right? So if this is one of the pushes behind uh, the, the ADA, if, if the only way to enter uh, Congress in DC is to walk up these giant steps yeah, into the right. building, right? Then you have all these people that are excluded from certain parts of public life. And so the social model of disability says that we're disabled primarily by an environment that is not built for bodies like us. Um, Sarah Hendren was at the January series this past year and has this wonderful book, uh, What Can a Body Do?, where she talks about designing products and environments for different kinds of people. But for so long, our products, our environments, our buildings were designed for what we took to be normal folks, normal people, right? That it prevented lots of disabled people from being able to do things. Uh, so the social model says that we're disabled by the way that our environment excludes us from certain kinds of activities. Um, I actually think that that's the right way of thinking about some kinds of disabilities. Um, that, that what is primarily problematic about certain kinds of bodily conditions isn't the bodily condition itself, it's the way that our environments, our social interactions, right, uh, treat the people with those conditions. So an example of this is autism. Again, autism is a very wide range of okay. conditions. I suspect that in the future, what we now categorize as autism will actually become a number of different things. I see. Um, 
But there are certain ways that autistics like to communicate. They, they typically uh, have difficulty picking up on indirect communication, on sarcasm. Right? They want everything to be spelled out uh, and, and clear because the autism makes their, uh, their autism makes their brain interact with communication in different kinds of ways. And so um, I, a lot of my research has been looking at autism. And, and what I think the difficulty, at least with respect to social interactions that, that most autistics face, is just that we have a set of interpersonal norms that aren't built for them, right? So that there's a way in which we could talk about autistic culture and autistic communication as part of autistic culture. And if we were aware of what those norms were, then we could engage with people for whom those norms right, were more natural in ways that we could uh, um, uh, foster better communication. Right? And so there's a lot of research that suggests that in autistic-dominated spaces, the kinds of social difficulties that mm. autistics mm. face <laughs> aren't faced in those kinds of... Right? So I've got a number of autistic friends, and the more that I've learned about sort of their preferred ways of... of communicating. In those spaces, I try to adapt more and more of the norms, right? So for instance, for a friend that I uh, have that, that it has a difficulty picking up on, on sarcasm, I either won't use it, or when I do employ it, I'll just flag it. Right? You'll say that was sarcastic. And that was sarcastic. <laughs> um, or um, right, there's a tendency in, in a lot of our culture to read into questions, right? We take questions sometimes as challenges. Yeah. Um, but a lot of autistic people ask questions just because they don't quite understand and want it to be very clear. So for them, a question isn't necessarily a challenge. It's an indication that I'm not understanding, right? And so if we understand what the process of questions is for them, then we can understand and we can interact with them in a way that the social difficulties that are part of the diagnostic criteria for autism aren't going to be there. Now, there are some conditions, I think, right, that the social model, uh, I've just indicated that there are some that I think yeah. the social model gets right, but there are others that I think the social model can't fully capture. And even some disability scholars like Tom Shakespeare think this. So take uh, bodily conditions that involve chronic pain, right? Chronic pain, I think, can disable. Of course. But if somebody's in chronic pain because of a lumbar issue, you know, or something like that, there's no environment that you yeah. can put them in that they're that not would... going to have. We could certainly make life more accommodating for them, right? But the, the change to social environment by itself isn't going to address all the aspects of chronic pain. And so because I think that disabilities are so widely varied, how we think about the different models mm -hmm. and what needs to be done about mm -hmm. them, I think is also yeah. gonna, gonna vary based on the kind of condition that we're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Um, in, your, in this wonderful little book, uh, little but, I mean short, but I was astonished at the scope of the issues that you lucidly talk about. In this book, you spend a bit of time describing, reporting the, the checkered history of the church with respect to how it has treated its um, disabled members. Well, actually, it's not all that checkered. It's mostly a sad history. I knew a little bit of that. I suspect that most of our viewers know a little bit of it. But briefly give us an indication of how historically the church has treated its disabled and why it treated them. I mean, that's really interesting. Why it treated them the way it did. Uh, just so we're clear, I do think that the, the history is checkered. I mean, I think that there okay. are some wonderful experiences okay. of, of um, this that can, that can find, I, you know, in the, in the ancient church, in the medieval church, in the modern church. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was, was led to uh, have some of the views that he did theologically that led him to the resistance to the Third Reich, for instance, mm. uh, because of this profound experience he had in, in, in a community for intellectually disabled mm -hmm. folks. So the, the, the history really is oh, checkered. It is checkered, okay. Um, but there, we sometimes don't like to talk about the less pleasant aspects of our own history. Uh, especially in the church, because right, we're we're not sure how to process them. We, we might feel that criticizing the church for various kinds of failures is is problematic. We don't want those to get in the way of the church's mission. Um, but but the 
the history, I think, is sort of the, the problematic parts of the history are there all the way back into scripture, um, right? Uh, somebody is brought to Jesus to be healed, and, and the disciples ask, who sinned, yeah. this person or their parents? Yeah. And Jesus rebukes them, right? You're thinking about disability fundamentally the wrong way. But that question was in the air, obviously. Well, and it's it's not only in the air, right? There are so many metaphors that Paul uses short period of time later, right? One of the dominant metaphors for, for Paul about the nature of sin is blindness. And so there is this deep inheritance of the devaluing of disability that we get in the church, even from parts of the scriptures. Augustine, uh, right, very influential Christian uh, thinker, talks about certain bodily, right, what we'd call physical con uh, disabilities now, bodily conditions as monstrosities. And he says that these people will only get the true form of human nature at the resurrection, suggesting that they're not fully, truly human. They're monsters. Yeah, they're monsters. Now, granted, right, the, the Latin denotation and connotation of monstrosity is slightly different. Yeah. Um, but it's shaped how we think about, right? Yeah. Yeah. Both monsters and disabilities yeah. all the way down through, right, contemporary fiction. Um, Luther, for instance, I talk about in, in, in a paper. Now, Luther probably had a disabled uh, uh, scribe or aide that he was very closely connected with. So, so again, even Luther is going to be a complicated figure here. Mm. But there's a book uh, called The Table Talk, and there's a number of different versions of it, and, and, and there are recordings of conversations with Luther. So he didn't write it, and the exact contents right, varies between. But all of them uh, talk about, all of them have Luther referring to a 12-year-old boy uh, there near him in Germany as not human, as merely an animal. Uh, and in some versions of The Table Talk, uh, he, he says that the boy is just a mass of flesh without a soul, right? So even Luther there, like you see this idea in wow. the way that, that there's a certain kind of devaluing. Um, Calvin, right, for all his wonderful uh, teachings, I think there are parts of Calvin's theology that are problematic. Um, Calvin's theology of the Eucharist, for instance, he takes the Eucharist so seriously that he, as a, as a condition for approaching the table, wants any individual to be able to give a proper account of, of their um, catechism, right? To make sure that they understand the nature of the Christian life to engage in this very deep, very profound practice. But if being able to give an account of the catechism <laughs> is needed for the table, we've excluded you know, all of, sorts of, of people. people, right? With intellectual disabilities, uh, and so there is just this history of uh, scriptural inheritance, theological inheritance, and actually cultural inheritance. Right? One of the really unfortunate things that I've discovered in my research in, the, in the, the leading up to the passage of the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990, there was immense debates right, in the, the mid to late 80s about the nature and scope of that legislation. Mm -hmm and all sorts of religious institutions, not just Christian institutions, um, but a lot of religious institutions came together and lobbied for a religious exemption for the ADA, and it was granted, right? So religious institutions, churches, synagogues, mosques, are exempt from the ADA. Really? You mean yeah. from the regulations for? The re regulations for, the, for some of the hiring practices, for the buildings, right? And part of the reason for that uh, was they so just said- me, So churches, don't have to have ramps. They can have they can have big steps. They can, and many of them do. And many of them do. One of the things I love about Church of the Servant that I know that you're right. It was there, designed there are no with steps. steps, and even a, a a gentle ramp in the shape of a yep. bell going up to the the platform, which is lovely. Um, but churches don't have to to have any kind of accessibility. Uh, there is a position paper for the CRC. I believe it's from 1993. Uh, after the ADA was passed, uh, the, the CRC said all CRC institutions and buildings should be AD, fully ADA compliant hmm. by 1995 or 1996. I can't remember the exact hmm. 
but we know that that's not the case, <laughs> right? Uh, almost 20, or sorry, almost, math is hard for me, 30 years later. Sure. Um, but they were also worried about, about sort of the anti-discrimination for hiring practices, right? So again, the, the, the late 80s are the height of the AIDS scare. Mm -hmm. And at the time, lots of folks thought about HIV status as a gay disease. And so there's actually documentation that I have uh, um, from some of the Senate archives where religious uh, uh, entities are lobbying for exemption from the ADA because if, if they are bound by it, then they might have to have gay clergy because they won't be able to fire clergy who are HIV positive because that's covered under the ADA. And unfortunately, many uh, disabled individuals, for all the problematic treatment that they find in the wider culture, think that the church is often worse, right? So, so autistics um, are only about 40% as likely as the general population to attend churches as adults. So there's something about the way that our religious communities, our Christian communities function, not always, Right? But in general, make lots of disabled people feel that they're just devalued, that they're not mm -hmm. welcome, that they're seen as second-class citizens, if, if, if citizens at all. Yeah. So do you have any general impression? Is, let's say, the North American church improving over the past 25 50 years, 25 years? I think that there has been uh, tons of improvement. There's been tons of improvement, again, in terms of uh, um, American legislation, uh, with the ADA and the IDEA. There's actually a really robust theology and disability literature that's been growing for the past 20 years. Uh, ben Connor over at Western Seminary, uh, Sarah Barton, John Swinton has done a lot of great stuff. Right? There's, there's wonderful work being done, and in some ways I think theologians sort of beat philosophers to some of these topics. I see. So there is, I think, this um, rediscovery of the church's mission uh, and the importance of thinking about and living out that mission in, in an intentional ways uh, with respect to disability. So there has been improvement, um, but I think that the, imp while I think the improvement is good, it's, it's been uneven, mm -hmm. it's, it's fragile in some, some cases, right? Some churches are known for being very disability welcoming uh, and inclusive and affirming, and then they get a new pastor and so much of that orientation was connected to the oh. role and influence of that person. And right, so, so uh, the, not just with respect to disability, but with respect to lots of things, the sort of the, the culture, the ethos, the ecology of a church yeah. can, it, right, depends on who is in certain kinds yep. of leadership roles. So there's been great improvements. Right? Anybody uh, with any kind of mobility impairment can come to our church. We have fully, uh, we both attend Church of the Servant. There are no steps in the building. Right. Uh, there are um, ADA compliant bathrooms. Right? This, and it, this low ramp to get the up. The low ramp all the way up. And to see somebody in a power chair go oh, up that oh, ramp to oh, read scripture. scripture. I, found that. I, I think this is wonderful. Yeah. Um, so there are great pockets. Um, Right? But, but it's, it, the, the yeast hasn't leavened the entire loaf, so to speak. <laughs> let's, let's talk about what you see as the overarching goal. You call it inclusion. Um, it's not pity, though some pity may be involved. It's not empathy, it's inclusion. Oh, and, and um, you quote a slogan of the disability rights movement. Um, in talking about it, in deciding what inclusion comes to, it shouldn't just be the able to speak up, but um, the disabled, uh, disability rights movement. Nothing about us without us. That's yeah. terrific. It, it, so, it's wonderful. So what's what's inclusion, it, and and why is it important? Yeah. So so the term inclusion actually doesn't have a super neatly spelled out sort of standard definition, and and I use it in that book. Uh, to basically pick out what Eric Carter, uh, who's now at Baylor, uh, describes as belonging, right? So I care more okay. about the 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 uh, content than the term itself. But he's got this wonderful uh, resource 
uh, where he sort of tries to illustrate different ways of thinking about disabled folks, right, in terms of, in terms of these circles. Mm -hmm. um, and the little dots represent people within those. The first is just exclusion, right? Um, and so people with disabilities are kept out of the community. Then, then the next stage is what he calls separation, so that there's the cluster of able-bodied folks, and then there's this other cluster outside. Maybe they're in the separated. same building. In the same Maybe build. in the same building, but they're often, yep, yep, right? Yep. And this is actually, I think, how lots of churches think about uh, uh, ministries for disabled, right? They're ministries for disabled people, and they're seen as separate from all the other kinds of, right? And they often get called special needs ministries, and they're all often uh, oriented only towards children, not disabled adults, right? So, so it's basically segregation. Uh, there's integration where the people are brought into, but they're still sort of all lumped together um, and, and they're not sort of dispersed throughout the body. Right? Then there's what he calls inclusion. And that's where somebody, uh, disabled people can be anywhere in that community, but they're still just sort of the recipients of ministries, the recipients of pity. And a lot of disabled people don't like pity at all. I, I understand um, uh, and, and so, and then what Carter is aiming for is what he calls belonging, where disabled people have access to all parts of the community. They receive from and then give back to. And so what he thinks of as belonging is roughly what in that book I'm talking about as inclusion. Okay, okay. But I think it, it's, uh, it, it's going to involve not just somebody being allowed in a space, not just being welcomed into a space, uh, but them to be actively valued, and not only actively valued as recipients of various kinds of gifts and goods, but the, the locus, the provider of those kinds of gifts and goods. Imagine if we all thought that we could learn from our disabled church members, not just administer to them, right, yep. but receive the ministry yep. from them, in part because people who have experienced things Ha often have a better insight into what is problematic about how they've been treated yeah. or sort of the dominant norm. And this is where the disability rights got their slogan, or uh, movement got their slogan, nothing about us. Without, without us. You can have well-meaning intentions that actually backfire in all sorts of ways. And so if the church only thinks about disability as for these folks, and we don't give them positions of leadership we don't uh, in, equip them to engage in various kinds of ministries, and we don't then see that as leavening the entire loaf. We've again, right, they're there, but they're not fully valued in the same way that we want to value other folks. So let me pick up on that, um, leaven the entire loaf. A, a thing that struck me about your discussion of inclusion was that it's not just for the well-being of the disabled, but the whole community is worse off if the disabled are excluded. Say, say a little bit about you and I are worse off. Yeah, I mean, I think that this, you know, plays out in um, uh, all, all sorts of ways, right? If, if you have a church that d doesn't have um, physical accessibility for folks, right, who, yeah. who need walkers or wheelchairs or canes, right, if the only way to get into the, the sanctuary is through steps, then there are folks that aren't going to be there. Yeah. And then there are things that those people could bring that we are not going to benefit from, right? You, you have um, folks who have been kicked out of the pastorate for having physical disabilities. And then there, there might be gifts of scriptural insight or uh, uh, mm. right, ministry that those people have been yeah. given by God yeah. that then we don't benefit from. It's in some ways, I think, parallel to uh, the history of racial exclusion in the United States, right? There's a way in which I think that the white American church is fundamentally worse off for having an environment that makes people of color feel unwelcome. Mm -hmm. It's bad for minorities and people of color, but there's also something profoundly missing, right, for, for the rest yep. of us. This is what I love, uh, yep. you know, in your book that I mentioned earlier, when you talk about going to South Africa and working to think through the legacy of apartheid that is deeply connected to our history, right? Um, 
it's the entire community of South Africa that is worse off for apartheid. Yeah. Not just the majority of, yeah. of, of the uh, black South Africans that are right, prevented from this kind of stuff. And I think some, something similar is, is true of disability. If, if we don't equip folks, we don't realize that we're failing to love people as we should because we're just not sensitive to the ways that some of our interactions exclude them we might not know, right? Lots of uh, people don't know that, that the American church is exempt from the ADA. And right, sometimes people say, well, we don't have any disabled members, so we don't need to have a ramp. Well, you don't have any disabled members because they can't get, right? And so it could be that it's the insight given by folks who have lived through this and understand what it's like that could bring certain kinds of benefits. And many of those benefits don't just affect disabled folks, right? They affect all of us. Um, so some churches, for instance, to give a very real practical example of this, right? Philosophers aren't always great at real practical right. examples. People with cognitive impairments often have a hard time following certain kinds of sermons, especially very rich, long, theologically, intellectually robust sermons of the kind that some of us really like, right? So some churches will basically have uh, a bullet point outline of sermons sometimes with little pictures to illustrate some of the, right, so that intellectually disabled, developmentally disabled folks can sort of follow along. Well, children often really benefit from that, That's right? Also, sometimes, yeah. And sometimes us as parents of children in services, <laughs> right, we're so busy sort of, right, yeah. responding to certain kinds of needs of our children that we get lost or we don't have all that, right? And so there's just something like that kind of visual aid can be very, very helpful for not just the people that we intended it to be for, right, but for all of us. And your thought is that, let's say, a classroom, a school classroom is enriched by allowing handicapped children, disabled children of that age and area as part of the regular classroom. Yep, and there's a, a robust uh, literature and education that shows that this is actually the case. Mm. That uh, not only disabled students who are educated with non-disabled students, but non-disabled students who are educated with and alongside disabled students are better in the long term. Not just academically, though often academically, yeah. but in terms of sort of the robustness of the moral formation that we're trying to do in terms yeah. of, of uh, education. And so segregated education like segregated churches, right? Segregated ministries within a church typically backfires. Uh, and so if we recognize this and work to make our communities more inclusive to foster the belonging that Eric Carter talks about, it benefits all of us. So Kevin, um, the most astonishing part of this book for me, I think astonishing is the right word, surprising is too weak, is your argument that, and the most astonishing for most readers I suspect, is your argument that there might well be disabilities in heaven sort of, it took me a long time to wrap my mind around that. I'm, I, vis I have visualized heaven as people have tossed their wheelchairs and their crutches away and they can all, they all have 20-20 hearing, they don't even need glasses and, and my nephew will have a good he hearing and, and, and so forth. Um, disabilities in heaven help us to think about that. Okay. So first off, I just want to say, I'm not saying, right, I'm not making a claim about all disabilities. I think okay. that's really hard to do. Okay. But I, I do think that it's important to sort of reshape our, our vision of, of, or our imagination. Right? Notice how deeply visual our language is, yeah. right? The vision itself might be a problematic term. The, the imagination that we have for what heaven might look like. And, and history has shown that we typically create our, our, our vision of what, or our, our uh, picture of what heaven will be like, sort of in our own image, right? And and so I think this has happened with respect to to disability. So start with something like language, right? You and I speak English. There are other people in the world that don't speak English. And so if we, how are we going to communicate in heaven, right? Well, maybe we'll all have like built-in translators. Right, so we each hear in our own tongue, you know, or something like that. You sort of just implant it, translate implant something, but then think about ASL again. I've said that American Sign Language, or, and there's there's other forms of sign language yeah. too, but there are benefits of 
sign language. There are, there are concepts that can, can't be neatly captured in spoken language that, that can be in, in ASL. So imagine if we thought that the, the way that we can all communicate in heaven isn't just about spoken language, but about ASL, right? It's about visualized language. And if we do that, then it's not going to be the kind of thing that uh, hard of hearing or deaf people have to have fixed in some way, right, in order for them to be part of the community. There might even be benefits to all of us, right? So maybe I could communicate with St. Peter across a crowded courtyard, right, using sign language rather than having to yell over the dim of all the harps and cellos and whatnot that are, <laughs> that are there. Um, or again, think about uh, uh, the autistic norms that I talked about earlier, right? There, a lot of disability culture thinks about it as just a different kind of culture. And if we want to take seriously cultural variety, it's not just American culture that we need to think about in heaven. It's not just modern culture. It might be disability culture um, as well. Uh, or here's maybe a different way to approach the question, right? Sort of when we think about heaven, what's most central? Well, perfect union with God. Through that, perfect union with love for and shalom, right? Within sort of our communities with each other, maybe towards animals and the environment and all that kind of stuff as well. But just take sort of our union with God and perfect union uh, with others. Is there anything about, say, uh, only having one arm that prevents you from having perfect union with God? Not clear to me that it does. Is there anything about uh, only having one arm that would prevent you having perfect union with all other humans? Well, depending on how they treat you, maybe, right? But notice there that it, what can be the hindrance to, to union with your neighbor, love for your neighbor, peace with your neighbor, shalom, isn't something about them, right, themselves, but about how you treat them or how they're treated. And so when we think about our vision of what heaven should be like, if we center not just what we're used to, but what is needed for perfect union with God, perfect union with others, true shalom, right? It's not clear that there are any, right, that, that everything that we call a disability is inherently antagonistic to that, <laughs> right? For all I know, right, there, there are a lot of sort of tropes where, where you see sort of the person who's a wheelchair user, right, like in the resurrection throwing off. Yep. Their, and a lot of... Rising up from the grave and they and, toss and, their and, crutches and, up and into the air. Yeah. It's tricky because Jesus healed people, yep. right? But Jesus often healed people, right? He didn't heal everybody, <laughs> but he also healed them in order to restore them to their communities. Yeah. Right? And so we have to think about the healing narratives. Um, but a lot of people that are wheelchair users, right, think about that as shaping who they are. Um, in the same way that I think about my history as a spouse, as a parent, shaping who I am. Uh, and so to have to sort of get rid of that identity, right, for heaven, to, to them seems like a real loss. And it might be that God doesn't have to sort of throw off those parts of our history unless they prohibit, right, the, the central norms, uh, the, the central goods that we're aiming at in heaven. And it's just not clear that disabilities are incompatible with that. Now, this is all speculative, right? Yeah, I've yeah. not yet been to heaven, but I think that so much of our vision, uh, our, our imagination of it, the way that we take heaven to be is shaped by the histories that we've been given, but it's often the dominant individuals, right, that yep, get to yep. shape that. And there's a, just yep. a long history of, you know, the, 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 the American white church typically thinks that race drops out of, of heaven. Heaven, yeah. Well, <laughs> right, us white people, we have a race too, right? It's <laughs> just not salient to us because it's not the, it's the locus of benefit power and privilege and not hardship for us. And so in the same way that I don't think that we have to let these histories of other, right, the other parts of our histories and our identities drop out, so too with, with heaven. Mm -hmm. And so that we ought to reimagine a broadening of the way that we think about perfect union with God and perfect love for neighbor. That's fantastic.
Well, I guess it's time that we move toward a conclusion. This has been terrific, Kevin. Is there some topic I haven't covered that you'd, that I haven't prompted you to talk about that you would like to talk about unprompted? <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, this shows you just how, this conversation shows you how uh, pervasive issues of disability are. Yeah. It helps and us understand our histories. It helps us understand our social dynamics, our, our architecture, our architecture our art. There's uh, lots of good cultural discussions these days about the importance of media representation for disabled no. people, for instance. Um, uh, Mattel has come out with the first uh, uh, Barbie doll with Down syndrome. Oh my goodness. And a lot of parents that I know who have children with Down syndrome think this is a great representation, right? Uh, uh, the way that we think about the, the nature of our religious communities and theological, right, philosophical topics. So I really don't think that there's a part of either an academic uh, field or sort of our lives lived as humans that isn't connected to disability in some way. So there's always gonna be more space for more conversations. But I think that this conversation has shown just how broad and enriching those conversations are. It, has, it has shown me at least, and I'm sure the viewers, how. Disability, the topic of disability just opens up in all kinds of, in all kinds of directions. Um, Kevin, thanks ever so much. You're doing a great work and we're all much indebted to you. Thank you, and including me personally. Thanks ever so much. Thank you very much, Nick.